Hello, Surajit. Sir, good evening, Ankika. Good evening, good evening, Ankika. Uh, uh, Ankika, more voice to finish, sir. Oh, sir, ठीक है sir. Ah, 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 हमारे सामने सामने join कोई नहीं की. Oh, sir, ये मात्रा join कोई से नहीं की. Andipa, you can start the session. Okay, sir. Good evening and warm greetings to everyone present here. Respected Principal Sir, Gorgon College, Dr. Sabesachi Mahanta Sir. Resource person of today's session, Dr. Tandan Kumar Sarma Sir. Respected Vice Principal, Gorgon College, Dr. Rina Handik Ma'am. Head. Department of Economics, Mahapurushu Sri Mantasankar Dev, Vishwa Vidyale, IQSA Coordinator of Gorga College, Dr. Surajit Sekya Sir, faculty members and participants from across the state. I, on behalf of the organizing committee, welcome you all to the one-week faculty development program on research methodology organized by IQSC Gorga College in collaboration with Department of Economics, Mahapurushu Sri Mantasankar Dev, Vishwa Vidyale. As the first agenda for today's session, I would now request respected principal sir of Gorgon College, Dr. Sabesachi Mahanta sir, to kindly deliver the inaugural speech. Sir. Thank you so much, Professor Sandipa. A very good evening to you all. Respected Dr. Rina Hendik, Vice Principal of Gorgon College. Respected Dr. Sandan Kumar. Sorma, HOD Department of History, Debrugger University, and today's resource person, Dr. Surajit Soikya, Coordinator, IQSC Gorgao College, uh, Head of the Department of Department of Economics, Mohapuru Shimonto Hongkor Dev Bisho Vidyaloy, uh, respected participants and my dear students. At the very outset, I am delighted to welcome you all to the five-day Faculty Development Program on Research methodology, methodology that has been organized by IQSC Gorgaon College in collaboration with the Department of Economics, Mohapuruk Srimanto Hongkordev Bishwabhidyaloy. As we all know, the research has become a very important part of higher education and NAP has also emphasized on the importance of research and NAP has already mandated making research a part of the undergraduate program also. And NEP proposes to set up a National Research Foundation also to strengthen, strengthen the research ecosystem in India. And uh, looking at the importance of research in higher education and incorporation of research methodology in four-area undergraduate program, our IQSC and 
department of economics mahapurukh simanto shankarde bishwavidyalay they have joined together to organize this five day uh, faculty development program on research methodology which is an important component of research and uh, we have uh, we have uh, invited five different uh, resource persons for the five day program and today's resource person is dr sandan kumar sharma he is an expert in uh, research, uh, research in social science research in historiography and today he would be delivering his speech on studies in ethnic conflict in south east asia uh, new trends and uh, perspectives so uh, i hope his uh, his uh, speech and his presentation would be beneficial for both the teachers research scholars and students and i hope the entire program the five day faculty development program would be a big success and i offer my sincere thanks and gratitude to dr sandan kumar sharma and all other resource person for giving us the consent and sparing some time to join join with us and deliver their and, and present their presentation on the topic with this uh, i also offer my sincere thanks and gratitude to the department of economics mahapurukh simanto shankarde bishwavidyalay for collaborating with us to organize this program and i also uh, i am also very much encouraged to see the enthusiasm of our iqsc and i also offer my thanks and gratitude to all the organizers and the persons associated in organizing this program uh, uh, in uh, associating uh, in in organizing this program and with these few words i hope this program would be a big success and i welcome you all and i declare the session is open thank you so much thank you so much sir for your inspiring words we always inspire us sir well we are all aware of the importance of research methodology in providing a scientifically sound knowledge base the fdp aims at sharing knowledge to the target audience about the new dimensions of research skills and about the contemporary developments that are taking place in various dimensions it also aims to enhance the abilities of the faculty members to carry out the independent research right successful research project and to enable them for the technical communication considering the national international journals and conferences having said that it is indeed a privilege to have dr sandan kumar sharma sir here with us today to deliver his insights on the topic studies in ethnic conflict in south asia new trends and perspectives Dr Sandan Kumar Sharma sir is currently the associate professor and head of department of history Dibrugarh University his work focuses on ancient india political history environmental history and historiography he also has numerous books research papers chapters and edited volumes to his name sir we are indeed elated and overwhelmed to have you with us today before i hand over the session to sir i would like to draw the attention of the participants that we are alive uh, we are live on zoom as well as on the official youtube page of our college the participants can send their queries on the chat and comment box on both the uh, available platforms feedback link will be shared in between the session in the comment box on both the platforms so without much ado i would like to hand over the session to dr sandan kumar sharma sir over to you sir hello yes sir yeah uh, thank you uh, i would like to offer my thanks to the principal borgong college for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak on certain issues which are so important in the context of south asia in the context of india as well as in the context oh, of so yes, north east yes. india uh. so you are not audible sir 
Yes. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Now you are audible. Yeah. Uh, I requested the uh, organizer to uh, share the screen from Gorgon College itself because I had certain problems in my uh, computer here in Dibrugar. So I would like to request them to start the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, yes, sir. I will be doing it shortly. Yes, sir. Uh, so I am supposed to speak on ethnic conflict in South Asia, studies in ethnic conflicts in South Asia, new trends and perspectives. Now, when you speak about ethnic conflicts, uh, in South Asia, we make a difference in between communal conflict and ethnic conflict. In South Asia, we basically speak whenever there is religious conflict that is termed as communal conflict. Whereas, uh, I would like to go to the first slide. Whereas, yeah, I will start later on. Yeah. Whereas, uh, the conflicts in between two or three or different ethnic groups, linguistic classes, these are basically termed as ethnic conflict in South Asia. But technically, in European parlance, ethnic conflict basically means any conflict which is related to its primordial identities, which are already there. So the term ethnic conflict, it also includes what we term in South Asia exclusively as communal conflict, as well as some other conflicts which are interrelated in between two ethnic groups. So here, when I'm using the term ethnic conflict in South Asia, it also means what we normally term as communal conflict, because communal conflict is also, in a sense, ethnic conflict, because that is also related with primordial religious identities. So here it is a wider category of ethnic conflicts. The normal divide as we do in North, in, in Northeast India or in India or in South Asia, that ethnic conflicts are different one and religious or communal conflicts are different one. That approach is not ex ex accepted here. So this term ethnic conflict in South Asia, it can be used to mean any kind of conflict which are related with primordial identities, whether that identity question is religion or language or any ethnic marker. So it's a wider basket, ethnic conflicts. Now, when you try to understand uh, the research related to ethnic conflicts, we know we have studies on ethnic conflict specifically, what we term as communal conflict in the case of India since the early 20th century, and specifically as ethnic or that communal conflicts, it became too complex, specifically in the 1940s, leading to partition of India. And even after that, India witnessed several problems of communal conflicts throughout the 20th century, even at the start of the 21st century, so we have a robust literature on communal conflicts. And when we try to understand ethnic conflict in Northeast in India, we also have lots of literature because Northeast India also witnessed problems of ethnic conflict. The moment we are speaking about ethnic conflict, we know the problems in Manipur between the cookies and the uh, Maitis. That problem is still raging since the last two months. In Sri Lanka, there had been that problem in between the Tamils and the majority Sinhalese. And the whole late 20th century, the problem was in, in between the Tamil Tigers of Tamil Ilum, LTT, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilum. They basically spearheaded a very fierce uh, 
armed insurrection against the Singhala state to have their own uh, state for the Tamils. And we know that the whole late 20th century, Sri Lanka suffered because of it a lot. So in India, as such, there have been conflicts. There have been studies related to conflicts. There have been lots of research on this particular area. Today, I will be speaking on certain new trends. New trends because they use some new perspectives. They use some new data. They use some new theoretical understanding uh, to unravel the problem of ethnic conflicts. The difference between the earlier literature on communal conflict or ethnic conflict is that they basically try to understand it in terms of uh, a, some kind of a very primordial difference in between two different groups. Uh, so there have been multiple approaches. There have been the approach of uh, primordial approach, which say that Hindus and Muslims, they are basically two different communities. And so there will be some problems leading, leading to violence. So that primordial approach was always there. That primordial approach is basically believed by the communal agents and the organizations, organizations who believe in some sort of a exclusive identity marker. Uh, then uh, there had been uh, the instrumentalist approach, which explains that violence as strategy of political elites to further their political and economic interests. So according to the instrumentalist approach, this particular kind of violence is mostly used by the political elites to further their own political interest. And that interest in certain cases is manifested through polarization of votes at the time of elections. Then there have been social constructivist approach. So social constructivist approach, it tries to understand the emergence of communities in terms of social constructs through time and space where prevailing discourses determine the course of relationship in between these two communities or the different communities. So social constructivist approach it is a new one which try to understand the very construction of the social identities. The identities which mostly formed in the colonial period, how they have been changing in the post-colonial period and how in the present time, the different uh, identities are being uh, constructed through uh, multiple agencies, through media, through social media, through lectures, through political party uh, literatures. So how, how identities are basically constructed, they're changed. So this particular social constructivist approach is a new one. So along with all these different kinds of approaches, we have a very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, huge amount of literature regarding uh, ethnic conflicts or communal conflicts in India, uh, in South Asia as such. Uh, now, I will be speaking about few recently published books. Recently means in the last two decades, some very interesting books have been published and which have really used a new kind of interdisciplinary methodology. The methodology where there is a very important work, empirical research is being done. Rather than only, uh, only understanding based on some conceptual methods, very generalized conceptual methods, uh, some of the new research scholars, they have tried to explain the problems of uh, conflicts, uh, identity conflicts uh, with sound work, empirical work on those particular areas which have seen such type of conflicts uh, in the late 20th century or specifically in the post-independent period. So uh, next slide. Uh, one particular very interesting uh, book that particular book is titled Ethnic Conflict, Civic Life, Hindus and Muslims in India. It is written by uh, Asutus Barsni. So it, the book was published in 2002. So the name of the book is Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Hindus and Muslims in India. In this particular book, he tries to understand the whole problem of ethnic conflict from the perspective of civic life. By civic life, life, he basically means the quality of civic engagement in between the Hindus and the Muslims. That means the quality of 
civic engagement, if that engagement is robust, if that engagement is very sound, if that engagement is there in different platforms, not only in schools, not only in colleges, but also in the markets, but also in sports associations, in other civic associations. So wherever there is a robust relationship in between the two communities in a particular lo locality, that civic life, which is manifested through cross-connected kind of a relationship in between the two communities, there the possibility of riots is much less. He basically says ethnic peace should, for all practical purposes, be conceptualized as an institutionalized channeling and resolution of ethnic conflict. So wherever there will be ethnic conflict, he says, whenever there are different identities, different ethnic groups, obviously there will be difference of opinion, there will be difference of issues, there will be conflict. Multiplicity of identities within the same space, it will obviously lead to conflict. But conflict does not necessarily mean it should lead to violence. So conflict can be channelized for resolution of ethnic conflict. And that resolution of ethnic conflict can happen through a robust civic life. Take for example, if cookies and the mates, they can have a robust civic life in a particular area, then that particular relationship in between the two communities can be used for channelizing a kind of a resolution for ethnic peace. But the problem is that if that particular civic engagement is very poor, if that civic engagement is very much intra, intra means all the relationships happens within a particular community, not cross-cultural identity, not cross-cultural uh, relationship. Only one particular community, all the relationship happening within that particular community. And the other community, every relationship is intra, not inter. So if the relationship is only intra, then there will be more problems. If there is any conflict, there is a possibility of it leading to violence. But if there is less amount, if there is more amount of civic engagement in between the two communities, take for example, it might be in the sports associations, it might be in the marketplace, it might be through local, some kind of a cultural performance where different communities will come together. So that kind of a strong civic engagement, which is intra, in between multiple communities, then there is always possibility of lesser amount of problem. Even if there is uh, conflict, that conflict can be resolved through dialogue because there is already civic engagement. So the presence and absence of civic engagement, according to Asutus Bursni, it determines uh, whether in a particular area there will be conflict and whether in a particular conflict within area that will lead to violence or not. Even if there is violence, that violence can be contained through the possibility of a uh, 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 institutionalized channeling of resolution of ethnic conflict through that pre-existing civic engagement. So uh, he interestingly, he takes uh, 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 very interestingly in this partic particular book, he tries to compare and contrast certain cities in different parts of in, in different parts of in, India for that particular part, for that particular purpose. He takes uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, uh, instance of uh, three different pairs of cities. In these three pairs of cities, there have been populations of Hindus and Muslims. But in certain cities, there was less amount of conflict, less amount of riot. But in certain other cases, there had been more amount of uh, riots. So he tries to say that in those particular cities, wherever there is more amount of civic engagement, there will be lesser probability of, uh, of, of, of violence. But if the engagement is very much poor, if there is not much of cross-connected kind of a relationship, the problem will be more. Uh, to answer this particular question, uh, he tries to uh, uh, compare one, two particular cities, Aligarh in UP and Calicut in South, South India. So 
Alicut and Ali Ali Aligarh. Alicut is in Kerala. Aligarh is in North. Al Aligarh is known for is prone to communal violence. But in Calicut, in spite of there having uh, Hindus and Muslims, there is lesser amount of problems in Kerala, in Calicut. So he tries to understand why so much of violence, communal violence, ethnic violence in Aligarh, and why there is less amount of problems in Calicut. Then he shows that in Aligarh, the relationship in between the Hindus and Muslims, they don't have much strong civic engagement. Whatever relationship is, is there, that is always intra. That means everything is put in the community. Even the schools and the colleges, marketplaces, it's very much ghettoized, it's very much differentiated in between the different identi identi identities. So wherever there is a religious conflict, that conflict always leads to violence in, in, Ali, in Aligarh. But in Calicut, in Calicut, they have a different history. And in Cali Calicut, they have a strong relationship in between the two different groups. And because of the pre-existing civic engagement, uh, Calicut, in spite of having communal problems, it does not always lead to a uh, riot-like situation. Then he pairs, interestingly, Barsni pairs history of Hyderabad and Lucknow. And he says, Hyderabad is very much prone to violence, riots between Hindus and Muslims, but Lucknow, it is relatively peaceful. Lucknow did not see that amount of violence in between the Hindus and Muslims. Now he tries to understand this problematic history of Hyderabad in a historical context. And he shows that since the late colonial period, Hyderabad had problems in between the Hindus and the Muslims. But on the contrary, in Lucknow, in Lucknow, there had been strong civic engagement in between the Hindus and the Muslims. So he, he says, uh, in, if in the first comparison, Hindus were badly divided along caste lines in the city of Calicut, in Calicut, in Kerala, the division was more in terms of a caste question. But in the case of Lucknow, in the 20th century, I'm speaking about 20th century because his data is from 20th century, because the book was published in 2002, he says in Lucknow, it is the Shia Sunni conflict in the city of Lucknow that have been functionally equivalent. By identifying the main enemy within the Muslim community, the Shia Sunni conflict facilitated Hindu Muslim integration. So in Lucknow, there is a mass level integration in between both the communities, which works as a defenders of peace. And this engagement is based on mutually dependent economic activities. This economic interdependence in between the two communities work as a bulwark of peace in Lucknow. But in Hyderabad, there is only elite Hindu Muslim integration and absence of mass level Hindu Muslim civic engagement, which aggravates communal tensions to develop into communal violence in, Hy in Hyderabad. So then towards the end of his uh, pairing, he studied in between two cities in Gujarat, Ahmedabad and Surat. And here also he tries to show that it is uh, his main thesis that it is a presence and absence of civic engagements uh, which determines uh, whether a particular uh, area, in spite of having ethnic conflicts, whether that conflict will lead to violence or not. Even if it leads to violence, a strong civic engagement will lead to a quicker resolution of ethnic conflict. But if all the relationships are absurd, if all the relationships happen only within the community, not inter-community relationship, then the problems persist. If there is any violence, if violence also continues for a longer period of time. Next slide. So according to him, pre-existing local networks of civic engagement between two communities stand out as the single most important proximate cause. Uh, there have been some interesting studies uh, 30 years back at the time when there was uh, Babri Majid, uh, uh, that uh, destruction of the Babri Majid in 1992. Even in Assam, there had been certain problems in between the two communities. But uh, even if there were tension in certain areas, it did not lead to conflict or violence, but in certain areas, it led to violence. There was a very interesting news news uh, perhaps it was in indian express uh, it says in 1992 
why communal conflict in Huzai, not in Hazu? Then this is prior to this particular analysis of the book by uh, uh, book by Asutus Barsne. In that particular news re report, it was being said. I remember I was in Cotton College at that particular point of time. That in Hazu there had been a strong bonding in between the two communities, and because of that, even if there had been some amount of tension, that tension was resolved. But in Huzai, that relationship was a little bit weaker, and because of this, there was uh, there was more problem in Huzai area in 1992. So this particular understanding of existing relationship, civic engagement in between the two communities uh, that can be used even in the case of Northeast India. We know that in certain cases in Northeast India, in spite of two communities living together for hundreds of years, they erupted violence, inter-ethnic violence. Take for example, around 2005, there had been violence in between the Dimasas and the Karbis. But again, because there had been continuous local networks of civic engagement between the two communities, so even if that particular problem in 2005 emerged as a communal or ethnic tension in between the two communities, but it was resolved soon. And after that, we don't see much amount of that particular tension in between the two communities. So uh, this particular frame, framework of the local networks of civic engagement that can be used even in case of the areas or the communities which where we see uh, emerging ethnic problems uh, in different parts of Assam or in different parts of Northeast India. So where such networks of engagement exist, tensions and conflicts were regulated and managed. Where they are missing, communal identities lead to endemic and custody violence. In rural India, in spite of absence of formal associations, civic interconnections exist among the communities. So he said that even in the villages, it might be the playgrounds or the entertainment or the community functions can provide interaction in between the two communities. Uh, so uh, this particular thesis, which speaks about, uh, speaks about the uh, uh, inter-ethnic relationship, uh, civic engagements. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, book and this particular understanding can be used uh, to other areas which uh, experienced communal or ethnic violence in the recent past. Uh, next slide. So every day and every day and informal forms of civic communication may contain conflict and tensions in the villages, but associational civic engagement is necessary in urban areas to serve the same process. Uh, so, uh, but this particular thesis was also crit criticized. Uh, Paul Brass, Paul Brass, a famous social scientist who had studied uh, communal problems in uh, North India for a long period of time. He said, uh, though it is important to understand civic engagements, but it is not always the civic engagements which decides whether a particular place will witness uh, communal problems or not. Because according to him, it is politics and police, not civic engagement or its absence that determines the course of communal violence. So Paul Bross said, it is the politics and police, role of politics and role of police, not civic engagement or its absence that determines the course of communal violence. So he basically suggests that it is not only the civic engagement in between the communities which always determine the course of violence, the state and the police also plays the most important part. Wherever the state is vibrant, the police force is strong, they have the political mandate to contain violence. Paul Brush says, even if there is communal violence, the state can immediately control it. So according to him, the politics and the rule of police is also important. And he says that it is not civic engagement or its absence. But when we try to read Paul Brass and his comparative pairs of different cities, uh, it also speaks a lot that yes, civic engagements at the local level, it always matters. If there is a vibrant civic engagement in between the different communities and specifically for uh, a region like Northeast India, where we have multiple different communities, 
multiple different ethnic groups as well as linguistic groups, the civic engagement in between the different communities is very much important to contain any conflict so that it does not lead to necessarily lead to violence. Next one. Next. Yes. Now this is another interesting book. Uh, this is written by Stephen Wilkinson. The name of the book suggests a lot about uh, what kind of thesis he is promoting. Hoots and violence, electoral competition, and communal rights in India. Now, Stephen Wilkinson and the earlier scholar, both of them, they basically uh, use the same amount of data. That means uh, the earlier book by uh, Asutus Barsni, uh, Civic Engagement book, and this particular book, Boots and Violence, both of them work together. They collected huge amount of data since 1947 till the last decade of the 20th century, but both of them, they come to different conclusions. And that is the most interesting part about social science. At the same, the same time, even in the case of conflicts and riots, what might be true in a particular area may not be true in a particular different area. So some of the findings which might explain the origin and evolution of conflict in a particular area may not necessarily explain it at a different place because society is so complex and it is so evolving situation that one set of thesis with probes uh, or which has successfully can explain the problematic relationship in between the different ethnic groups may not be used in a different context because our local histories are different, local politics are different, and the sense of history itself is different. Anyway, now he says, the book starts with a very interesting comment. The comment was made by Richard Nixon. He said, riots are spontaneous, wars require advanced planning. And this particular thesis is negated by Wilkinson. Wilkinson says, no, riots are also not spontaneous. Even riots also needs advanced planning. So he basically starts with this particular quotation by Richard, but at the same time, he negates it. He says, no, there is an instrumental approach towards this particular thesis written by Wilkinson. And he says that there is a clear pattern which can be established by trying to understand the different problems of ethnic violence and communal violence in different parts of India, and how it can be correlated with the question of boots and power sharing problems. So name of the book itself is suggestive, Hoots and Violence, Electoral Competition and Communal Rights in India. Now, according to him, the riots are solutions to the problems of how to change the salience of ethnic issues and identities among the electorate in order to build a winning political coalition. So winning political coalition, according to him, that politics of a winning political coalition, it determines uh, whether a particular area witnesses violence or not, or whether any violence happening in a particular area is contained immediately or not. So problems of origin, at the same time, the continuity of ethnic violence, according to him, depends upon the whole political arithmetic. So he links it with hoods and violence. Next one. He states there had been uh, uh, no proper explanation specifically in 2022 why uh, why uh, communal violence could not be stopped in that particular state of Gujarat. Uh, but he says, but similarly, Sandrababu Naidu in Andhra, Andhra Pradesh or Digvijay Singh in Madhra Pradesh, they basically were successful in containing the uh, ethnic violence in 1992 or subsequently. So according to uh, Will Kilson, state governments protect minorities when minorities are important part of party's current support base. He shows that in the post-independent era, Hindu-Muslim violence happened even in Congress rule states. He said there had been multiple problems, communal violence, even in Congress rule states. Gujarat, where, which, when it was ruled by Congress, it also witnessed continuous violence for months in Gujarat when Congress was ruling Gujarat in 1960s and 1970s. So he says, again, it is not a question of uh, BJP or Congress, it's a question of winning formula within a particular state. 
So according to him, it is a winning formula whether a particular party declares itself as secular or not, or not secular, that is not important. It is the division among the boots and the whole winning combination which determines whether there will be problem, problems or not. So he shows that in post-independent era, Hindu-Muslim violence happened even in Congress rule states. And at one time or another, Congress politicians have both fomented and prevented communal violence for political advantage. Now he says that in certain cases they fomented and in certain cases, they also prevented. So again, for him, it is boots and violence because he gives a very electoral understanding of communal politics in India. Because of that, he reduces everything only to boots. Next slide. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting uh, book. Uh, in, it's a very interesting book. Uh, before that, I would like to go to the previous one, earlier slide. Yes. Uh, now, Wilkinson, he used statistical analysis along with qualitative data based on archival resource, extensive fieldwork, and primary and secondary sources. So as a researcher, this is more important. So he uses statistical analysis with qualitative data based on archival resource, extensive fieldwork, and primary and secondary sources. So it's a purely interdisciplinary method. Archive is there, fieldwork is there. Uh, personal interviews are there. So he tested his theories of electoral explanation of Hindu-Muslim violence in India by using state and town level data on Hindu-Muslim riots in India for over five decades. Uh, now, uh, his explanation of communal riots in terms of electoral politics is criticized by Asutus Bosni. So Bosni in his review, which was published in 2005, he said, uh, Bosni states, that as the data was town specific, it needs further investigation to arrive at the conclusions drawn by Wilkinson. Now all the data were mostly urban data. The data which was collected by Asutus Bursni as well as Wilkinson, both of them arrives two different theses. Now Bursni criticizes Wilkinson by saying that he's trying to give a state-wise electoral explanation of communal violence, but whereas the data was mostly town centric, urban centric. So this is one particular criticism against Wilkinson by Achutus Bursti. Moreover, regarding the power of the Indian state to prevent conflict at will gives the impression of the Indian state as a monolithic and omnipotent entity. Now he says that Wilkinson says that the power of the state can determine or can really stop violence at a particular moment of time in a particular state. But Bursley says that Indian state is not so a monolithic state. Multi-party interest and even within the police and bureaucracy, there might be different thinking going on. So he says that uh, regarding the power of the Indian state to prevent conflict at will gives the impression of the Indian state as a monolithic and omnipotent entity. And Bursley states, that the ruling party is the boss of the bureaucracy and the police forces, opposition parties also wield considerable power. It's a very interesting point given by Bursni. Bursni says, though the ruling party is the boss of the bureaucracy and the police forces, even the opposition parties also wield considerable power. Moreover, the police forces and officers can also subvert the ruling parties through subterfuge, dissimulation, and pain compliance. So, there are different kinds of logic at the same time, bureaucracy, whether the ruling party, they can really, uh, they can really uh, manipulate or they can really control uh, uh, the entire bureaucracy as they will. So there are certain problems as far as uh, Bursni says. So he criticizes uh, Wilkinson that his data is imperfect. At the same time, it will be wrong to suggest that the bureaucracy and the police force always works on behalf of the ruling party. And there might be some other different kinds of interest going on within that particular different stakeholders. So that very understanding of a monolithic and omnipotent entity of an Indian state, he also criticizes this particular understanding as it was put forward by uh, Wilkinson. Now, next book. This is a riot politics, Hindu-Muslim violence, and the state, Indian state. Uh, now, 
he gives a very interesting point. He says, okay, uh, as the instrumentalist theory says, that it is the elites who mobilize the masses to go for communal violence, through which they basically want to capture power. Now, Berenson asks a different question. Why the common people, why the urban proletariat, they support such kinds of violences? Why they become party to such riots? Why they are always on the streets? So why the urban proletariat is on the streets and doing the violence? So why they support these kinds of things? So Berenson, again, he show, he's a very, uh, he's a very uh, reputed uh, social scientist, uh, through his uh, groundbreaking work in Gujarat, he tries to show, uh, extend the process of mobilization and instigation through which the common people become part of the communal game. According to him, uh, although today most authors agree that many communal riots are instigated by political actors, there's little insight into actual mechanisms that underlie the mobilization for and the instigation of violence. So that mechanism itself is absent. So he tries to uh, give certain explanations uh, how that particular mobilization is being done and why the urban proletariat they support. His main thesis is, is that Indian state is a mediated state. Mediated state means that all the welfare measures, uh, uh, for all the welfare measures, the common people are dependent on the political parties and their mediators, the ruling party workers. So because of their complete dependence to get some sort of entry into the welfare measures, they are part and process of this communal mobilization as well. So he says, because there is not so much of developmental activities, or that means universal expansion of the welfare measures, who will be included in a particular scheme, who will be excluded, that is determined by the party workers. Because of that, the common people, they're dependent on the parties. So this kind of an explanation, but it had a very uh, sound, robust work on the, at the local level. And he basically unravels uh, the local problems and how the local people become embroiled in communal violence. It's a very interesting groundbreaking work. Next. Next slide. Next slide. So give me five minutes. Uh, there's some okay, no problem. Okay, uh, uh, so I was uh, I was speaking about uh, Baron Such book and uh, now let me come to another uh, interesting work. Uh, it is Sudha Pai and Sajjan Kumar. Uh, Sudha Pai and Sajjan Kumar, their book is Everyday Communalism, Riots in Contemporary Uttar Pradesh. Uh, they basically try to explore the, the, the small riots in different parts of Uttar Pradesh, specifically in Uttar, in Eastern Uttar Pradesh, and how the different political parties, how the interested groups, they behave uh, in different political riots in Eastern Uttar Pradesh and why such kinds of uh, inter-religious conflicts, they persist. Uh, now there's a very interesting book. It is written by Ajoy Varghese. The name of the book is Colonial Origins of Ethnic Violence in India. So in this particular book, he tried to explain the origin of ethnic violence, ethnic violence since the colonial period. Next. Next. Yes. Uh, so according to Sudha Pai and Sajjan Kumar, uh, this, there have been shift in the strategies and it is being said there is a combination of quiet nationalism, quiet communalism and low intensity incidents and a consequent rise of communalism without communal riots. So, uh, and, and there have been also in the riots in the urban areas, there is emergence of mafia dons rise of the class of frustrated, educated, unemployed youth, increasing cultural conflicts of our religious practices, 
decline in local industry due to globalization. So these are some of the issues because of which uh, there were uh, riots in different parts of North India. Next. Next, I have said it. Next. Uh, next. Yeah. Now let us come back to this particular book, The Colonial Origin of Ethnic Violence in India. Now the author ex explanation of the colonial origin of ethnic violence in India gives primacy to the changing nature of colonial administration in India, especially after the revolt of 1857. He basically says, after 1857, uh, the British were no longer interested in annexation of new Indian states. So there have been multiple uh, princely states in this part, princely states, they basically rule according to their own politics. Only some British resident commissioner was present in this particular princely states. And this, in these princely states, the politics revolved around religious lines. But whereas in the directly administered states by the British, the politics revolved more on caste. Next slide. Next, yes, the princely states which were indirectly ruled had their own autonomy where different rules of social certification worked. In the British provinces, caste became the central troop of administration, whereas in the princely rulers gave primacy of religion over caste identity. Now author picks up Joypur and Azmer districts. Uh, according to author, these two cases are remarkably similar, except that during the colonial period, Joypur was a princely state Azmer was a British province. And he shows that in Joypur, there was more communal violence, but whereas in Azmer, there is less amount of violence. And he tries to go back to a very colonial origin of violence. Uh, next slide. Uh, the same thing he also tries to explain in the case of Kerala. In certain places of Kerala, take for example, Southern Travancore region, which was a princely ruled state, uh, there is more amount of communal tension, but in areas which were directly ruled by the British, there had been less amount of tension. Uh, so he says, under the areas which were ruled by the British, uh, caste question became more important. Caste politics became more important. But in princely ruled states, uh, the religious mobilization was promoted by the princes in those provinces. Because of that, in the post-independent period, the problems persisted. Next. Uh, this is again a very new, new book. It also tries to understand the caste and Hindu nationalism, the violence in Gujarat. Uh, it's written by Ornit Sahani. It also tries to explain from the point of view of caste question and the decline of industries in the late 1980s and 1990s and how uh, caste conflicts emerged in Gujarat in 1980s, and later on, it, uh, it, it mutated into religious violence. Uh, so my basic purpose was uh, to give uh, a perspective of the different interpretations and the different uh, uh, perspectives through which inter-ethnic and communal politics and communal violence have been interpreted. Uh, these particular kinds of understanding can help us to understand our uh, the problems of interacting violence in Northeast India. So the whole perspective about uh, about electoral politics that is always important to understand. At the same time, civic engagement it's a very strong, interesting theory that is also very important to understand. And in the present problem in Manipur, perhaps some of these particular perspectives can help us to understand the historical origin of the movement conflicts at the same time, how to contain and establish peace in this particular period. So obviously the state is important, the policy is important, the politics is important, the electoral politics is equally important, but at the same time, we must always remember that quality of civic engagement is also equally important. If any area, if they are the, an inter-ethnic community relationship very good, it is difficult to foment violence in that in those areas. But if the relationship is only intra, everything happens within a particular community, then it is always easy for a conflict 
to recede into a uh, violent conflict. So uh, perhaps uh, in the case of Northeast India, these theories of electoral politics, ethnic conflict, at the same time, identity and caste civic, is, civic is issues, uh, at the, uh, uh, equally the colonial origin of the different conflicts, this can help us to explain our own region in a new way, in a refreshing way. So here I stopped about the different understanding. My basic point was to explain some of the new books which has emerged in the last two decades, which have tried to explain uh, the conflict situation in South Asia through a new perspective. And in this new perspective, the most important importance is given to a interdisciplinary method where archive is important, historical archive is imp important. At the same time, local sociological understanding, uh, empirical method, survey method, and most importantly, the qualitative research, going back to the people, talking to the different group of people about the impact, about the different practitioners who participated, who suffered, and everyone, every blended interdisciplinary methodology have given uh, new explanations about inter-ethnic inter -ethnic and communal violences in South Asia. Thank you so much. So here I end my presentation. Thank you so much, sir, for your interesting and enlightening presentation. Um, it was indeed very interesting uh, as you uh, let us know about between the ethnic groups as well as the books which have been recently published and they are, uh, they are in, uh, mostly on empirical study like the civic engagement, votes and violences, real politics and so on. Now, uh, I would now like to open the session for discussion. If anybody has any question, you can please put up your questions in the chat box. If anybody has any question, please do ask. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, my name is Rinal Ghosh. Yes. I'm an uh, assistant professor in Gorga College. Okay. So uh, this is uh, just, uh, I want to know one view from you. I came across one news. Uh, in the state of Assam, as you uh, rightly mentioned, that uh, they are uh, uh, they are when any conflict or any kind of uh, political changes, any kind of conflict happens, there uh, could be uh, some opportunity for the uh, space for the politics also. So uh, recently, the government of Assam has uh, withdrawn the district uh, status of a uh, few districts, uh, Biswanath, Hojai, uh, which were recently declared as district, and on top of that, also. Uh, today, only uh, we uh, came across one uh, more news that two legislative assembly seats uh, from Barak Valley would be curtailed. So how uh, do you see this thing uh, from the viewpoint of uh, uh, opportunity in politics? Uh, first of all, uh, before we speak on these particular lines, uh, we have to be very much accurate about the news reports. Uh, we cannot speak on the basis of ifs and buts. So that news item has to be accurate. The data has to be accurate. If it is a government policy, that is number one. Uh, number two, obviously these are related with electoral politics. It cannot be, it cannot be de de denied. It was also in the past, last delimitation when it was being done. Again, there will be different kinds of calculations. It is always true. So it cannot be it cannot be denied. But whether a particular area there have been lesser number of seats, it has to be declared news. Otherwise, uh, it cannot be explained or taken as an information value to give a uh, personal opinion 
regarding such matters. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we you. have, so we have um, two more questions. Uh, one from Biman Kumar Nath, sir. So how do you define ethnic engagement that has been explained in the first book? Yeah. Enge engagement is in between different communities. Uh, that engagement starts from the primary school level itself. It may be engagement within the school, colleges, educational institutions. It may be engagement of different religious groups, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, in playgrounds, in sports associations. It may be in the local Bajar community, Aham Hale Bihu, Pun Pun Ase, Bivinodhono. It may be totally, it means engagement at different levels, whether it is formal associations or informal associations. But, but uh, Asutosh Barsni has suggested that wherever there is a strong civic engagement, it might be in the cultural front, it might be in the sports front, it might be through educational institutions, it might be through uh, urban civic bodies, it might be business, as, business associations, but wherever there is always strong inter-ethnic relationship at the local level, even if there is conflict, that conflict does not always lead to violence. Even if it leads to violence, it can be contained easily. But if such kinds of relationship does not exist, if relationship are always within the communities, not inter-ethnic community, only intra occult community mazot, then even gossip can lead to violence. Even some rumors can lead to violence. So, but wherever there is rumors, if there is inter-ethnic relationship, that rumor can be contained, that they can sit, to get, sit together. So he basically suggests it may be modern civic societies, it may be traditional civic engagements, but the point is clear, there must be different kinds of civic engagements at the cultural level, at the sports level, at the educational level, at the business, le business level. But civic engagement in between the different ethnic communities, it is always important. That's it. Thank you so much, sir. We have another question from Dr. Abdul Malik Nurid Islam. It was a great presentation, but I would like to clarify myself on the perspectives offered by Varsne and Bruce. Don't you think these two viewpoints seem to clash in their respective take on civic engagement? Who regulates civic engagement and how for the psychological baggage associated with identity formation accounts for it. Obviously, uh, Asutus Bosni, his thesis is different. Paul Bos' thesis is different one. So Paul Bos spoke in terms of an institutionalized riot mechanism. And uh, Asutus Bosni, he tried to, tried to understand the local different context. So uh, as I told, these books are important because they mostly give importance to local level empirical data analysis. So even in certain areas, wherever there is strong civic amenities, strong civic engagement due to politics, there might be communal problems. But point is sure that as Asutus Basni suggested, that strong civic engagement, there might be possibility of restoring peace easily. But if no such history of civic engagement between the different communities, if it is always two different communities, always working differently, then the differences persist and there's always scope for uh, violence, uh, conflict and violence. So as you say, that yes, these two uh, perspectives are totally different one. Not only these two, every book they deal with differently. As I suggested when I was starting my lecture, that India is such a huge, vast country. One particular conclusion, which might be true for a particular context, might not, may not be true in other contexts. So everywhere we have to look it empirically. But what is important is empirical data, interdisciplinary data, and try to understand it from a fresh perspective. That is that was the main purpose of this particular present presentation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you hello, sir. hello, sir. Yes. 
বিপুল কুমার রাভায় কো মানে কো বারো এস পি বি গার্লস কলেজের পর মানে প্রশ্ন সুদিব খোঁজা নাই মানে জাস্ট শেয়ারহে করব খুঁজো এই যে সিভিক এংগেজমেন্টের কথা কলে ধর আপনি কিছু ফর্মর কথা কলে আপনি ঠিকই কে সিভিক এংগেজমেন্ট বরপরা লাগিব মানে আইডেন্টিটি যে আমি সরপরাই মানে মাল্টিপুল আইডেন্টিটির কথা অমর্ত সেনে কে কনফ্লিক্ট এন্ড ভায়োলেন্স নামের কিতাব বা ফুকামাও আজ কে রিসেন্ট বুক এখন যে এই আইডেন্টিটি বস্তুব বা আমি আমার যে সেলফ আইডেন্টিটি বস্তুব আমার ভিতরতে থাকে সমাজে কেন স্বীকৃতি দিয়ে সেটার উপর ডিপেন্ড করে গে আমি মানে পিছল কেনকা ধরনের হম এই ফুকামায় কে আর অমর্ত সেনে কে যে আমি সিঙ্গল আইডেন্টিটি লই থাকলে নহব আপনি যে আমি যে আলোচনাত আজি পালো ধর অক মানে যদি রাভা হয়ে থাকো এটা এটা নিশ্চিতভাবে কনফ্লিক হবই স্যার মানে মানে অক রাভা যে ধর মানে এক্সাম্পল হে লো আপনি অক শর্মায় হয়ে থাকলে এই কনফ্লিক হবই গতি এনেকা কিছু আমি আইডেন্টিটি গঠন করব লাগে মাল্টিপুল আইডেন্টিটি ধর মানে প্লেয়ার হব পো সিঙ্গার হব পো টিচার মে বি ওয়ান অফ দ্য আইডেন্টিটি ডিফারেন্ট আইডেন্টিটিস রাইটার মে বি ওয়ান অফ দ্য আইডেন্টিটিস তো এইবরে মানে কনফ্লিক আমার সলভ করার সহায় করব হিন্দু মুসলমান বিভিন্ন সত্তায় এটার ওপর এটা পিয়াজ নিচিনা কি চলি গিয়ে থাকে কিন্তু কথা হল কি যে ইয়াত যেহেতু কথা কে বিভিন্ন পরিচয়ের সংঘাত যাতে নহয় আর সংঘাত হব পে সংঘাত মানে যে সেই সংঘাত গিয়ে পেলে এক ধরনের একটা কি কয় এই কমিউনিয়াল কনফ্লিক্ট গিয়ে পেলে ভায়োলেন্স হব লাগে হিংসাত্মক ঘটনা যে হবই লাগবে তার কোনো কথা নাই সেইটাই কথা যে যত অকম বেলেগ বেলেগ পরিচয় থাকে সেই বেলেগ বেলেগ পরিচয়ের মানুষখিনিও বিভিন্ন ধরনের এসোসিয়েশনে হোক স্কুলে হোক এডুকেশন ফরামে হোক স্পোর্টস বডিয়ে হোক একটা কাম করার যে একটা পরিবেশ সেই একটা থাকার পরিবেশ বিভিন্ন ক্ষেত্র অক আমার ধর্মীয় পরিচয় নহয় অক আমার একান্ত ব্যক্তিগত এথনিক পরিচয় নহয় তো তার বাইরেও বাকি সিভিক যেন পরিচয় আছে আমি সিটিজেন সিটিজেন হিসাবে সেই পরিচয় সমূহ বিল আমি একটা যদি কাম করবো তেতিয়া হলেও যথেষ্ট পরিমাণে সংঘাত কমি থাকার পরিবেশ এটার সৃষ্টি হয় বিভিন্ন পরিচয়ের মানুষ অক নিজের পরিচয় সেই কথা নহয় আমার ভাল রাস্তা লাগে আমার ভাল মেডিকেল কলেজ লাগে আমার ভাল আমার নিজের ইনস্টিটিউশন ভাল হব লাগে এই যে আমার বাকি যা বাকি যা সমস্যা আছে সেই সমস্যা সমূহ বিল অক ধর্মীয় কথা হয়ে থাকা নাই সে আমার অক এটা এথনিক পরিচয় সমস্যা নহয় দিজ আর কুয়েশ্চেন অব আওয়ার আওয়ার সিটিজেনশিপ আওয়ার ওয়েলফেয়ার মেজার্স সেই প্রশ্নবিল যদি আগত যদি আহে তো বাকি পরিচয় সদায় ইমান গুরুত্বপূর্ণ হয়ে না থাকে সেই কারণে আমার এজ এ সিটিজেন আমার যা ওয়েলফেয়ার মেজার্স সেইবিল যাতে স্ট্রং যাতে হয় তেতিয়া হলে সেইবিল ওপর যদি কথা যদি কো অন ইস্যুজ তো হলে আমার সদায় যা অক সংঘাত হবপরা যদি প্রাথমিক পরিচয়ের কথা সেই প্রাথমিক পরিচয় সদায় গুরুত্বপূর্ণ হয়ে নোলাবও পে সেই কারণে আমার এজ এ সিটিজেনশিপ বাকি যেন ইস্যু আছে ওয়েলফেয়ার মেজার্স তাতো আমি অকান কথা পতা ভাল দেন পারহেপস ইউ কেন শিফট ফ্রম দিস প্রবলেমেটিক আইডেন্টিটি ইস্যুজ শিফট হে পারমেন্ট এভলিউশন কেউ নহয় ধন্যবাদ থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার থ্যাংক ইউ স্যার আই গেস উই ডোন্ট হ্যাভ এনি মোর কোয়েশ্চেনস Uh, so with this we have almost come to the end of today's session i would like to now express my heartfelt gratitude to our respected principal sir of gorgaon college dr sadasachi mohanta sir resource person dr sandan kumar sharma sir and the participants so with this uh, we conclude today's session thank you thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you sir